Hey, I'm James, and in this video I'm going to discuss the muscles of facial expression. The aim of this video is to address the general layout of the muscles, though I will talk about general functions as well. At the end of the video, I will discuss facial nerve lesions and facial muscle paralysis. Be sure to check out the associated article on the Geeky Medic site, where more details are given on attachments, innovation and blood supply. Subscribe to Geeky Medics to be the first to know when we release new videos. The muscles of the face are often referred to as the muscles of facial expression, but perhaps have another, more important job, as they are primarily sphincters and dilators of the facial orifices. For this reason, they are generally divided into three or four functional groups, depending on the source. The attached article splits the muscles into three groups based on the functions of the muscles, and I will do something similar. However, I have included an extra group, the epicranial group, and changed the name slightly to account for the variability often described. The facial muscles are sometimes quite difficult to appreciate in pictures because some muscles are more superficial than others. Consequently, I will change the model slightly so that it is possible to see all muscles clearly. I will start with the muscles around the forehead and scalp and will then work my way to the muscles that attach to the lips. The epicranial muscle group is mainly formed by occipital frontalis. A small muscle known as temporoparietalis is sometimes included within this group, though this muscle is extremely variable and is not often described, so I have not included it on the model. Occipital frontalis is formed by two paired muscles joined by the epicranial aponeurosis. Here we can see the right frontal part of the muscle, or frontalis, though the contralateral muscle is removed from the model. On the sagittal view, we can clearly see the frontal and occipital parts of the muscle joined by the epicranial aponeurosis. Posteriorly, we can see the two occipital parts of the muscle, divided by an extension of the epicranial aponeurosis. The circumorbital and palpebral muscle group include the muscles that act on the skin around the eyes. Included within this group is levator palpebrae superioris, though I'm not going to describe it here, as this is often included with the extraocular muscle group due to its attachments and innovations. Orbicularis oculi is the sphincter of the eye, it is a broad, flat muscle that surrounds the circumference of the eye. Depending on the source, either two or three parts are described. The palpebral and orbital parts are most frequently described, which act to gently or tightly close the eye respectively. The lesser described lacrimal part draws the eyelids medially to aid drainage of tears into the lacrimal sac. Corrugator supercilii is a small muscle at the medial end of each eyebrow. As you can see, it is deeper than orbicularis oculi. It inserts into the skin above the supraorbital margin. The muscle acts to draw the eyebrows medially to shield the eyes from sunlight. Contraction also produces wrinkles between the eyebrows. The nasal muscle group includes procerus, nasalis, depressus septi, and levator labii superioris aliquae nasi, although this last muscle can also be included within the buccolabial muscle group. Procerus is a pyramidal muscle attached to the fascia covering the inferior section of the nasal bone and the skin between the eyebrows. As you can see, it blends with the medial border of frontalis. Procerus draws the eyebrows medially. Nasalis is located here on the model. It consists of a transverse and an alar part. The transverse part compresses the nasal aperture and the alar part acts to widen the nares. Depressor septi is a small muscle that attaches to the incisive fossa and nasal septum. It too acts to widen the nares and can cause the nose to dip when some people smile. The Veta labii superioris aliquae nasi is a relatively long, flat muscle that attaches to the frontal process of the maxilla and passes to the alar cartilage of the nose and the lateral part of the upper lip. The portion of the muscle attached to the alar cartilage dilates the nose, and the other portion everts the upper lip. The buccolabial group contains superficial and deep muscles. The superficial muscles are those included in the text box here. Passing from medial to lateral, and back to medial again, we have levator labii superioris aliquae nasi, levator labii superioris, zygomaticus minor, zygomaticus major, rosorius, depressor anguli oris, and depressor labii inferioris. Note that most of the muscles that I have identified attach to the upper, lower or angular portions of orbicularis oris, and so act to raise or depress the lips in varying ways that allow us to portray certain emotions, such as happiness, like when we smile, or sadness when we draw the lips down. 
The specific attachments and functions are described in the article on the Geekimedic site, but I will discuss platysma and orbicularis in a second. The deeper muscles include levator anguli oris, buccinator, and mentalis. Once again, note that these muscles insert into orbicularis oris. Buccinator is a tricky muscle to appreciate because it lies deep, and so I will have to remove masseter, along with the ramus of the mandible and underlying pterygoids to see it clearly. Buccinator is the muscle of the cheek and extends from the angle of the mouth and continues posteriorly to attach to the superior and inferior alveolar processes, as well as the pterygomandibular ligament most posteriorly. Beyond the pterygomandibular ligament is the first pharyngeal constrictor, which is in the same plane as buccinator. Buccinator compresses the cheeks against the teeth and assists the tongue in pushing food between the teeth. Mentalis is located on the chin, just deep to depress a labia inferioris. It helps to protrude and invert the lower lip. I will zoom out quickly to identify platysma. It is a large muscle that passes from the clavicle to the mandible. Platysma mostly acts to tense the skin over the neck, but can also draw the lower lip down as some fibres insert into orbicularis oris. The remaining muscle is orbicularis oris, which encircles the oral fissure. This muscle is the sphincter of the oral cavity. The previously described dilator muscles attach directly to orbicularis oris, like levator labii superioris aliquae nasi, levator labii superioris, and zygomaticus minor, and depressor labii inferioris. These muscles are referred to as direct labial tractors. Many of the other muscles attach indirectly into the angle of the mouth via a fibromuscular mass known as the modiolus. The precise position of the modiolus is highly variable as a consequence of associated movements, as well as factors such as age, sex and ethnicity. However, knowledge of its positioning and movements are important in prosthetic dentistry, as prostheses can move or become dislodged when the modiolus moves. So let's just summarise quickly. The facial muscles act as sphincters and dilators of the facial orifices, as well as muscles of facial expression. These muscles are divided into separate groups depending on location and function. I just want to finish off by talking about facial nerve lesions and subsequent facial muscle paralysis. Motor nerves are generally divided into upper and lower neurons. Knowledge of this anatomy is often important when determining the location of a lesion that is affecting a motor nerve. This is especially true for the facial nerve, as a lesion either on the upper or lower motor neuron will present slightly differently. Information destined for the upper and lower portions of the left side of the face originate from the right cortex, decussate in the brainstem, and synapse in the facial motor nucleus. However, you will see that not all fibres decussate. Some nerve fibres for the upper portion of the face remain on the ipsilateral side and synapse in the ipsilateral facial motor nucleus. The lower motor neuron fibres continue as cranial nerve 7 to the upper and lower portions of the face. An upper motor neuron lesion will therefore result in a paralysis of lower facial muscles on the contralateral side, though the forehead muscles will be spared. This sparing is a consequence of the bilateral innervation to the muscles in the upper portion of the face. A lower motor neuron lesion will result in paralysis of the ipsilateral facial muscles with no sparing. This is because that although the upper muscles are innervated by upper motor neurons on the left and right side, the lesion is beyond the site of bilateral innervation. So that's me. We'd love to hear your feedback on what you thought of this video and what topics you'd like us to cover in the future. You can do this by leaving a comment or dropping us an email.